There are also a fair number of, of people beginning to do cognitive rehabilitation. Uh, and this kind of gets back to your question of, well, what can you do? Um, and uh, so this is one example of uh, a cognitive rehabilitation technique that has some, um, uh, has some evidence that it's successful. Uh, so it's called uh, memory and attention training. Uh, it was developed by a colleague of mine when I, I was up at Dartmouth for quite a few years. Um, and basically it has several components. So one of which is sort of uh, an educational component. So just to talk about cognitive errors and different types of attention and memory. And we have a tendency to kind of, when, when we have a problem, we have a tendency to re think that, well, everything was perfect before, but now I have a problem. Well, in fact, cognitive errors are very common. We all, uh, I make cognitive errors every day. <laughs> I forget things. I misspeak. I can't find words. Um, and you all did too before you ever had a cancer diagnosis. So part of, it's important to, to keep in mind that the goal of a treatment is to kind of get us back to as close to, you know, sort of the same level of cognitive errors that everybody else makes, not perfect memory, not perfect uh, concentration, and that sort of thing. Um, there are compensatory strategies that, that people use. I mean, we're, we're sort of in an electronic age, and so people are taking advantage of electronics for, you know, making lists, calendars, you know, using Palm Pilots, uh, Blackberries. Uh, what, what I, keep, I can't even keep up with all the new like, droids. I, well, my son was trying to tell me about a droid. I thought it was like you know, a Star, Star Wars thing, but no, I guess it's a new electronic gadget. So um, you know, part of it is getting more organized using you know, whatever it is, whether it's lists. I mean, for some people, it's stickies on the refrigerator, whatever works for you. I mean, if you're, I'm, personally, I'm just kind of getting used to using a cell phone, so I'm not a real electronics geek. So I, pen, pencil and paper is, is good for me. But, you know, again, depends on what, whatever helps you to stay organized is useful. You know, scheduling and time management. If, if you have trouble multitasking, if you have trouble doing more than one thing at a time, try to schedule your time as much as you can within the constraints to do this and then complete that task, move on to the next thing, you know, and move on to the next thing. Now that's not, depending on your work and your life demands, that's more or less feasible. But the concept of trying to um, schedule things so that you don't have um, multiple deadlines on the same day, and that sort of thing is often very helpful. This self-instructional training is something that my uh, uh, colleague has used, and it's, it really kind of goes back to the way in which we learned as we were kids. You know, if you watch kids, they often talk out loud, and then when they're trying to do something, they say, and now I do this, and then I do this. And that's how we learned how to do things. Again, that process becomes totally automatic when we're adults, for most adults. But sometimes, so one of the ways to try to um, keep yourself on track and not get distracted is to set down what are the steps I need to do and to kind of talk your way through it. You don't have to be talking out loud. You can be talking in, internally. But it's really a way of keeping ourselves on track and keeping ourselves organized. Um, again, sleep hygiene, fatigue management. You could put exercise underneath there because you know exercise is probably one of the best ways of uh, improving sleep and, and reducing stress. But there is some evidence, and, and there haven't been any studies in, in, on cognitive functioning in cancer patients, but in older adults, there have been studies showing that exercise can have positive effects on cognition. So there needs to be studies done looking at the effect of exercise on cognitive functioning in, in cancer survivors. And, and there are people I know that are beginning to move in that area, but there aren't any 
uh, results yet, but it makes sense that that would be something that would be beneficial. And I personally recommend that to, to, to everyone, to just try to up your exercise level to the, to the extent that you can. And, even, and you don't have to be going to a gym and lifting weights and using power machines. You can, you know, just walking, uh, you know, swimming, biking, whatever, you know, fits into your schedule and to, and, and to your preferences. Uh, it's just, it uh, can, be, it can be useful in just 30 minutes a day. I mean, if you can, and, uh, you know, here in New York, if it's uh, rather, you know, taking a, uh, walking to the next train station and, you know, trying to build it into the routine as much as possible so that uh, it's something that you can, um, you know, sort of have as part of uh, just a day-to-day -day activity. Um, for some people where, you know, again, stress and anxiety are, 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 are issues, things like relaxation exercises, meditation, yoga, we, you know, it depends, again, on, on, uh, uh, on your preferences. I think there are many roads to relaxation. You know, Tai Chi, uh, uh, you know, almost any, any of these approaches can be beneficial. Um, but to the extent that we can keep ourselves relaxed, um, it can, can really help with the co uh, cognitive functioning. Um, and then there's sort of this problem solving component, which is to say, when, when, he, when you go through this therapy, it really is, if you say, I want to just, you know, have better cognitive functioning, that's a little bit too broad, okay? It's sort of what is your, what is it that you're not, trying to define what is it that you can't do, what are your goals, and how can we def figure out strategies to help you meet that goal? You know, and trying to really break it down into very concrete uh, steps and, man and, and potentially solvable problems so that you can you know, sort of chip away at it and find out you know, how maybe, you can, maybe there are workarounds, maybe there are ways you can improve, maybe there are, um, you know, maybe there's ways that capitalize on, on uh, neuroplasticity. Um, so it's all, uh, it's all about what are your life demands, what is it that you can't do now that you wanna do, and how can we try to, uh, come up with strategies to help make that happen. Um, so there are people doing research on this and there's some interesting initial results in terms of both neuropsychological testing and quality of life. People are beginning to take the next step and, and actually use the fMRI, the functional MRI to see do, if you go through this kind of training, do you actually see changes in your activation in the brain? It kind of again gets back to that issue of, of can we somehow harness that plasticity of the brain and try to make it more efficient and more useful to, you know, rather than just letting the brain kind of reorganize on its own. 